Welcome to the We Get Outdoors podcast. My name is Rob Yates, I am your host, and welcome to this epic episode. In today's episode, we get to meet Suyash Kasheri. Suyash originates from India and has spent much of the past decade living, working, and studying in the United States. Suyash has spent the past decade stalking tigers in central India, getting charged by elephants in South Africa and being followed by dolphins in Costa Rica. Having travelled over 23 countries and perfecting being a wilderness photographer, Suyash has recently partnered with the World Wildlife Fund to release his first documentary series, Safari with Suyash in India. You can check that out in his YouTube channel and hear more about his adventures, how you can tell stories about the wildlife, about getting up close to tigers and lions, and often getting too close to some of the world's biggest, scariest, they'll kill you animals. So sit back, enjoy, get ready to laugh, get ready to cry, and get ready to hear and learn more about Suyash Kasheri. This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe, where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth, and become part of a tribe of like-minded outdoor enthusiasts, sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips and insights, and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. Click on the link in the description below to join for free right now. So today we have Suresh um, Keshari joining us on the podcast. This guy takes photographs and um, does videography like nobody I've ever seen it of wildlife before. And so I can't wait to share him and his inspiration with the Uyghur Outdoors tribe. Uh, Suresh, welcome to the podcast. Rob, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's super, super awesome. And, um, and so tell me, like, you're renowned for photography, wildlife presenting, traveling all over the world, doing what I think is super cool stuff. Where did it all start for you? <laughs> uh, I think it started at a very, very tender age. I was actually four years old, and it, it didn't start with photography or filming. It actually started with wildlife, and that's where my core passion lies. I was standing in front of a cage uh, in one of the zoos in India. At that time, it used to be the biggest zoo in India. This is 20 years back. And I was with my grandfather and I was standing next to a tiger cage and my, and my grandfather was looking at me and the tigers just snarled at me. And just like any other kid, I got very excited and started jumping around, clapping my hands. But you know, at, at that time, I'd already started watching Animal Planet, National Geographic, and uh, then my grandfather came up to me. He sat next to me and said, you know, do you like seeing these animals in this cage? And I said, yes, grandfather, I love it. Uh, of course, me being a naive kid that back then, um, anyone would love that. And that's when he said, you know, these uh, animals are bound in this four by four cage for the rest of their lives. And this tigress is not the same tiger that you see uh, in National Geographic or An Animal Planet or documentaries made by them. So I think that set a, set a precedent that broke my heart at a very young age. And from then on, I just knew that I wanted to do something in this field. And of course, photography came later as one way of telling stories uh, about conservation, about my travels, about my experiences, the outdoor adventures, the thrilling experiences I had, and that transitioned into the raising awareness uh, about about these animals, their habitat, and and um, then that transitioned into filming and presenting on in front of camera. That's awesome. You've just finished your first series for the uh, World Wildlife Fund, your first documentary. Tell us more about that. Where did you shoot it? Why did you shoot it? What's it all about? How can we watch? Yeah, so uh, this series is called Safari with Suyash. It's um, uh, with WWF International. And I finished filming it uh, last August. Uh, actually, it was, it was a self, um, you know, completely independent project uh, once I moved back from the United States. Um, I had a childhood dream that I want to have my own, own series about wildlife. And once I moved back from the United States after quitting my job in political advocacy, um, because I wanted to follow this full time, and I thought this is the time to take the risk and do something and make something out of my passion. 
So the idea was to literally just make something and post it on YouTube um, on my own account and then pitch, uh, pitch some other work to someone else uh, and have this as my portfolio. But I filmed all through May, June, um, knowing uh, Central India really well. I've grown up there. I've followed tigers all my life there. I've grown up with tigers. I've followed some tigers since they were like just two or three month old cubs. And now they have cubs of their own. Wow. So I followed those cubs uh, in Bandhavgarh National Park. It's world famous for its tigers. It's, it has one of the highest densities of tigers anywhere in the world. And I know these tigers very, uh, very personally. So yeah, I, I filmed that. I bought it all together. Uh, the idea was not even of a series at that time, but I, I just kept filming. I kept presenting. I just did everything I knew. And then I was, uh, at that same time, I was talking to WWF International because they'd approached me about my tiger photos and my stories because they really liked the way I tell stories. And I donated 250 photographs to them, after which they inducted me into their WWF Voices, uh, which is their Young Ambassadors and Content Creators program. And then around August, when I had like just about finished filming and I was editing the first cut and stuff, and I was like, why don't I pitch it to WWF um, and see if they have some advice? So I reached out to them, uh, showed them first few episodes, and they really liked it. Uh, so I decided to pitch the entire series to them. They, they loved it. And they said, you know, tire conservation is right up our alley. This is what we do. Uh, and yeah, then we decided to do it together. And then we, uh, we released it uh, on December 6th. Um, and all through the month, new episodes. So it's kept coming out and now WWF International's YouTube channel. Uh, if you pre if you just search Safari with Suyash, it should come up on YouTube or you just have to go to uh, go to WWF International's uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, so that's just like a brief background about Safari with Suyash season one. Uh, this is season one. It's based around Tigers, five episodes, but I'm now in the process of filming season two, which is partly been filmed and good news is it's in South Africa. Uh, so right where you are and <laughs> cool. Yeah, I can't wait, can't wait to bring that. We will have to meet up in person, do a round two of the podcast, but do it on camera when you when you get the chance to come here and this silly virus has gone out of the way. Yeah, the, I can't wait for that day to happen. That'll be fantastic, wouldn't it? That, that would be absolutely amazing. So you must have got up super close and personal to these, these cats and these different animals. Um, <laughs> like, how do, you, how do you balance that, getting the image you want without disturbing them in their natural habitat? Yeah, uh, super important question. And yes, I have found myself in places where I'm uh, very, very close, sometimes uncomfortably close to big cats, uh, even even sloth bears and elephants uh, and other animals here in, in the forest of India. Uh, you know, first, of course, like, just like every other big wildlife filmmaker, I use big lenses. So sometimes we don't really have, have to approach them too close. Uh, but we try not to approach them directly. The number one thing about good, being a good wildlifer, uh, being a good naturalist, being a good, uh, good wildlife lover is understanding animal behavior and respecting it. So big cats, uh, any animal in that matter, they give certain signs. They'll wiggle their tail, they'll move their ears back if they are feeling threatened, they'll crouch down. And we usually observe those behaviors. But with tigers, just, just like with lions, mostly tigers are very curious if they're used to the tourist vehicles around them. Uh, if the tiger has never seen a tourist vehicle, most likely it'll just stay away from it and not even come close. But usually tigers are pretty curious, especially tiger cubs. Uh, so we just, once we track them, we just have to position ourselves. And then within, a, within half an hour, one hour, they get very comfortable. And, they, and then we do our own work and they, and they don't mind our presence. Uh, but we never try pushing the boundary. We never try getting too close. Uh, in fact, one time my car was just positioned in a perfect spot. And the tigress, uh, whose name is Solo, uh, she's the protagonist of my film. And I've known her since she was about four months old. And she has four cubs now. And the, the entire documentary series is, is devoted to finding Solo and her cubs. So one time we found Solo, she was just about 25, 30 meters from the vehicle and something struck her uh, cord and she just 
approached us very slowly, uh, showing no aggression, nothing. And I was just glued to my camera. I was, I was, you know, looking into my eyepiece and I didn't even know how far she was. I was using a 200, 600 millimeter lens and I was focusing, focusing, getting amazing shot. And suddenly she comes so close that my focus is gone. And I was like, wait, why can't I focus? Is my camera okay? Uh, because considering it was 48 degrees Celsius, it could malfunction. And I looked up and she's literally two meters from the lens. And I'm like, oh my God, wow. <laughs> but uh, she was just sniffing and uh, she sniffed for two seconds and then she was on her way. Um, so yeah, those instances are cool. But, but you know, it, it's always a fine line. So it's, it's as much about being and having a trained eye uh, and working with trained professionals. I work with two trained professionals who are local guides. They know they are experts at animal behavior. I am not an expert at animal behavior just as they are. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's, it's important to work with a trained professional and never blur this boundary. Mm. I was, um, when I, f I first started coming to Africa, oh crikey, 15, 18, maybe even 20 years ago now, it was quite a long time ago. Um, and, and I remember being in a vehicle driving around in Swaziland and, um, uh, we, the vehicle stopped and I, I looked out of my passenger window and there is the world's biggest bull elephant next to me. And I, I said to my wife who was driving, how do you know when an elephant is upset? And she says, oh, that's easy. They stamp their feet and then they flap their ears and eventually their trumpet. And I looked out of the window and there's this huge elephant two or three meters from the car, stamping its feet, flapping its ears. And then it started trumpeting. And I almost wet myself at that point in time. Oh my God. Uh, that's awesome. And it's also funny that you said crikey. Uh, it reminded me of uh, good old Steve Irwin because he always used to say, crikey, mate. <laughs> ah, Steve Irwin, bless him. Rest his, God rest his soul. He did, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you have any Steve Irwin uh, a, a, a things about you? Do you want to go and uh, wrestle a tiger, catch a crocodile, anything <laughs> like that? Um, no, I don't think I want to do, do that. I think our styles are very different. Uh, I would love to learn how to wrangle snakes, though. I think Steve Irwin did that really well, and that's something I, would, I, I haven't learned. Uh, I would not like to wrestle a tiger or play with any of the big cats or any of the other animals, uh, knowing very well that they're very dangerous. Because Steve Irwin, when he did that, it was usually with his captive animals in Australia Zoo. Mm. Um, yeah, so you know, those, those animals are used to, used to human presence. Uh, but the animals I'm, I work with, uh, no, they're completely wild. They're not in zoos. So I think if I tried hugging Solo, as much as I would love to do that, I think she would, she would consider me lunch or dinner that day. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, we, how do people go about striking this balance between wild animals and humans? Because obviously, obviously you spoke at the start of this about like a misbalance, a tiger in a cage. Um, and as I go around South Africa, uh, and I hike a lot around um, Southern Africa, we, we end up with uh, local villagers who are, are desperate to kill leopards uh, or kill any natural animal that could be a threat to them. Um, and slowly but surely, humans are eradicating those animals from the planet. How do we kind of form some harmony, do you reckon? Yeah. I think there are a few ways to do it. Uh, firstly, like if, if we talk from the consumer standpoint, uh, from, you know, in terms of tourism perspective, uh, I mean, your company itself, it says we get outdoors. So just the company's name itself is fantastic because it just shows get outdoors. Don't get into places like zoos where animals are caged. You know, now tourism is more accessible than ever. You can go to a place like Kruger and see animals in, in, the, in the wild. You can go to a place like India and see tigers in the wild. You can go anywhere in the world uh, it's relatively reasonable as well. And if you don't want to spend that much money, there's always animals in your backyard um, everywhere. Um, mm. Sorry, just... Sorry, some call just came. I'm sorry. I hope you, you're able to cut this out. Mark. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I was saying, you know, there's... A, so there's a balance. Uh, I think people can always explore animals and wildlife in their backyard and uh, they don't have to really spend that much money. And what that is essentially doing is educating everyone 
about the plight of these animals. So tourism serves a huge purpose in educating people about the plight of these species. And when it comes to the local, uh, local uh, populations, such as you said, right, like people want to kill uh, leopards in Africa or big cats that are harming their livestock or, or possibly the people itself. Uh, India has a huge problem with that as well because, you know, we have the leopard, the, the tiger, and the lion. Um, so that doesn't gel well with people. But I think that's where both governments and private parties have to kind of reach an alliance uh, to alle alleviate the problem of the people. I'm a strong believer that you cannot, uh, you cannot alienate people from the topic of wildlife conservation. Uh, we don't live in a world that is Shangri-La that is, that is independent of human interference. Every single place on earth, even the deepest parts of the Amazon have human influence in them. So it's the best to address both human and wildlife together when talking about conservation. So for instance, in India, uh, there's a new program when a cattle dies uh, within a reserve, uh, and if it's killed by a tiger or leopard, the farmer receives compensation. Uh, earlier, what, what would happen is the farmer would not receive compensation and would be out for the big cat's blood in return in terms of retaliatory killings or poison the carcass. Uh, so that's just one way. And then the second way is, I think the biggest beneficiaries from this tourism and from any economic incentives or economic activities around the reserves, be it a private game reserve or national park like Kruger or, or any of the reserves or national parks here in India or anywhere for in the world, I think the biggest beneficiaries should be the local people. Somehow tourism needs to help them alleviate themselves economically because it all comes down to economic factors. Uh, why they're scared of uh, these animals and why they're, they, they're uh, losing their livelihood because of these animals. Uh, I mean, for instance, you know, we have these huge amount of deer population uh, around in, in the reserves, but what deer do is they go into the farmlands at nighttime to feed on the, feed on the crops. So that's a huge, uh, huge, huge uh, uh, um, detriment to the farmers, economically disastrous to the farmers. And then, because there are such large congregations of deer at nighttime in these farmlands, that's what attracts the big cats. And that's why sometimes big cats end up killing humans by mistake. Um, I, not because they potentially want to feed on them, but usually because they're scared of them or because they, they, they see some kind of a threat. Uh, of course, sometimes it also happens that they want to prey on them, which is certainly uh, really bad. But you see, it's, it's all... Uh, deeper level of conflict that needs to be addressed together. Uh, the time, the, till the time we have poverty uh, in and around our reserves across the world, till that time there will be human animal conflict. Mm. Is it something that can be eradicated completely this conflict or is it something that could just be improved do you think? I think uh, we, I think it, it, the eradication part is we are very, very far from it. I think the eradication can only be successful if all the national parks are completely fenced off, but that is not ideal because then how will two populations, say for example, you know, you have Kruger National Park, you have Baluli uh, Private Game Reserve, and you have, uh, then you have Lion, Sam, Lion Sands Private Game Reserve, uh, two big famous game reserves uh, with private conservancies within the Kruger National Park. Mm. Um, and this is hypothetical. I'm giving you know, your viewership and you a very hypothetical scenario. Let's say if today, uh, if 10,000 people live in and around Baluli and Lion Sands, and then in between them is a small corridor which connects two lion populations, two distinct lion populations or two prides or five prides. For in order for one one pride's males to disperse successfully and join the other pride and take over the other pride, they have to pass through that corridor or migrate from Baluli to Lion Sands or vice versa. But if we were to fence those reserves, um, because in, invariably, if those lions move around, they might come in contact with people and something might happen. If they kill a car cattle, that's that's disastrous to the farmer, but if they kill a human, that's even more disastrous to the entire community and to the family. So if we were to fence off the entire, both the reserves, then we have these two satellite populations that will never interact with each other. 
And within 10, 20, 50 years of time, uh, there'll be too much genetic inbreeding and then they will go extinct. Um, so I think that can never be achieved that we can have zero uh, conflict. I think those conflict can be very limited and those conflict can only come um, towards cattle. We, I think we can definitely uh, eliminate human conflict directly uh, in terms of like, you know, big cats or any other animals uh, killing people. I think that can be eliminated through a lot of ways and mitigated tactics. Uh, but just otherwise cattle killing, that's, that's something that's, we just cannot achieve that because our world is too overpopulated and people are not addressing the right, right, uh, right factors on that. Mm. Yeah, that's just a hypothetical situation, you know, yeah. just giving my two cents on what I think and have learned through observation. No, it's fine. It's a it's, it's an age old problem that we're that you and I are unlikely to solve in sixty minutes or so on a podcast. Hey, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> but I do think you're right that the money needs to go back into the into the population, local population. How, how do we work with? Um, so you've mentioned Kruger a whole bunch of times, and as you know, in Africa, the the rhinos are uh, fast becoming extinct because of uh, mostly because of the rhinos being killed for their horns. What are your thoughts around that? And, and how do we work with maybe the Chinese to stop them desiring such things? See, um, I think, you know, how you guys are facing the same problem as us. Uh, for, for us, it's, it's rhinos as well as tigers um, that are being poached. We only have 2,967 uh, tigers left. Uh, and that's also a very uh, conservative estimate. Uh, the number is supposed to be much lesser than 2,967. And we have uh, just a couple hundred rhinos left. I think it was eight or 900. Uh, mm. I might be wrong at that, that number because I'm not too familiar with the rhino counting process and it doesn't happen pretty frequent. Um, but I think, I think sometime, at some point of time, the entire world needs to reach on a consensus and uh, countries like China, Vietnam, South Korea, Laos, Cambodia, Japan, all these countries that use rhino horn, that use uh, traditional medicines, which involve animal parts and products, um, all the other countries need to band against these countries in terms of their, the, the, the stuff they uh, eat um, and consume. I mean, we know that coronavirus, 90% uh, of it, it, it came from uh, pangolins, eating pangolins uh, from a live uh, market in Wuhan, China. But, you know, I think people also need to realize that it's not only these countries. Uh, for instance, did you know, uh, but until the early 2000s, 45% uh, Americans believe in traditional Chinese medicine, including the use of tiger bones to cure cancer? Really? Yeah. So that's the thing. It's, it can be at your home as well. So I think the world consensus needs to come together and there really needs to be a rigorous scientific study uh, done to prove them wrong and also uh, uh, prove that, you know, we're going to get nowhere. So I don't think uh, we can just put pressure on specific countries one, uh, one at a time. I think the world needs to come together and understand that this is a priority. Um, because again, like in terms of rhino horns, it's, it's never been a priority. When I talk about priority, like it should be the top agenda for every single government. And it is not, uh, of course it can never be a top agenda, but it should be up there in the list among other things, including the economy, economy and poverty and other things. Um, because these things completely affect us as we are seeing the coronavirus, um, and, and other things as, as in terms of, uh, deforestation, climate change. And so many other factors. Mm. It, it's interesting when you think about owning a, a home. I've got a house here in Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, and I spend a lot of time and effort on my house um, doing maintenance and making it better and improving it and making, making it look nice and keeping it clean and tidy. And um, I wonder whether that that agenda that you're talking about, if we were if if we as a population of planet Earth was to view planet Earth actually as our house, you know, that pride and joy of the home that you pay for um, and actually were to start maintaining it purposefully, whether or not we'd actually have a um, much more healthier wildlife population, but also a healthier world to live in. Yeah, that's an amazing analogy that you used. I think I think 
the minute people start caring about earth as their own home instead of like oh someone else's responsibility um because you know people blame governments people blame organizations but you know rob you i and everyone else out there are equally to blame in every single thing uh we just have to own our responsibility and do our best to do our best every single day simple as that that's it that's it if we if if uh we're likely to have 100,000ish people listen to this and if all 100,000 100,000 people who listen to this would just decide to do recycling and that was it recycle their paper and metal and plastics and whatever else and do it properly the impact on the world would be would, would actually be very significant absolutely like uh you know veganism is a big trend nowadays and i was having a uh, an interview the other day and there was another panelist with me and the panelist said you know everyone should go vegan and i said look you know the thing is it's impossible for everyone to go vegan at once some people might some people might not some people might take 10 years to become vegan and just so on and so forth but the thing is to save the world you cannot say that everyone has to go vegan i understand the benefits of being veganism i'm not going to get into the vegan uh vegan non vegan <laughs> but what i'm trying to say is if everyone did 1% better every single day if 2% better if they maybe took a 5 minute shower instead of taking a 20 minute shower maybe if they recycled as you said if they did 1% better if your 100000 listeners did 1% better those things combined together will make the difference mm and there there isn't a one size fits all thing either because um you you mentioned veganism and um i've working in the outdoors for as many decades as i have done often when i'm on an expedition i'll i'll eat vegetarian food um and only take vegetarian food because obviously it doesn't go off it's easier to cook you can have a month's worth of vegetarian food or vegan food with you and and be absolutely fine um and all of that works really well till you end up in the arctic circle in the middle of winter and after two <laughs> weeks two weeks in the arctic circle your body is craving meat protein and animal fat like you would never believe exactly exactly so true um and i and i don't know that i'm sure there's somebody on here who's listening to this who will understand the physiological reasons why but uh you just end up desiring really crappy meat <laughs> that's too fatty and and i don't know why but in that temperature um being a vegan vegan just doesn't work <laughs> uh, i have been on those temperatures so i wouldn't know but i would like to see it for myself as well uh, i would be fantastic to shoot in the in the, in either of the poles to be honest oh i haven't been to antarctica yet but the uh, the arct up in the arctic circle is is amazing especially in winter when it's like minus 40 degrees minus 50 degrees um it, it's amazingly beautiful and um yeah very 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 hard to operate a bit like you were talking about your camera in plus 48 degrees maybe malfunction malfunctioning your lenses and cameras at minus 40 degrees will have very special moments let's just put it like that Yeah maybe when instead of a tiger coming so close we could have a polar bear. <laughs> yeah. Polar bears, reindeers, all sorts of crazy things. Um so so you mentioned to me before we started speaking that you once had a job in politics. How does a a guy who was brought up in India get to go study in the USA then work in Washington DC in politics and then end up back in India again? I'm confused. uh yeah it's a, it's a quite a journey for sure but uh you see politics is like my second passion uh, but it's not the it's not the politics it's, it's more about political advocacy is what my passion is my second passion and uh i like to think uh about uh cultivating change uh through dialogue and and doing making favors and exchanging favors in order in order to make uh that advocacy and exchange of policies work uh but i studied politics in wake forest university in north carolina how i ended up there was uh i finished my when i was about to finish my schooling here in india uh and i used to be a big uh football player uh so soccer player uh for your american audience or any of the countries that call football um uh soccer so yeah i used to be a big football player um and i had gone to france 
at a club called FC Metz, uh, which is just about seven hours from Paris in a place called Lorraine. Uh, it's called Lochen in French. And um, I, I'd gone there for tryouts. So I got selected uh, to play for the team, but I did not know any French. Uh, so the, I, they said, okay, uh, it was midway through 12th grade. I either had to repeat my uh, 12th grade or uh, in French and then possibly fail it because I didn't know any French. And then, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> continue playing there or come back to India and join a school in India uh, and play soccer here. But then some of my, uh, some, some of the people who are, who are already in the U.S., they suggested, why don't you look at the U.S.? It has the best education system and the soccer level now is very competitive as well. Of course, not as Europe, but still, you know, competitive, competitive enough that you can play. And I looked at a few universities and Wake Forest happened to be number one in, in, uh, in U.S. Um, yeah, so I decided to apply to Wake Forest um, I, um, and among some other universities. I got into Wake Forest. I studied politics and international affairs. Um, and then I also did a minor in entrepreneurship and journalism. But this photography and filming and wildlife was always in the back of the head. But at some point of time, due to a lot of external factors, I gave up that dream. Uh, because I, I, I let others influence uh, my decisions and what I want to do in life. I let society essentially judge it because, you know, uh, what you and I do uh, and what a lot of our listeners would be doing as well is, is considered very uh, non, uh, not in the, in the main track, uh, not in the standard track of becoming a doctor, lawyer, or any, any business owner or investment banker or some, something like that. Mm. Um, we are independent business owners in our own right. So, yeah, then, you know, I, I, I continued with politics uh, in terms of education. Then I uh, worked in the U.S. House of Representatives uh, in the U.S. Congress. And then I joined a political advocacy group. Uh, and then just about a year into it, I just realized, man, I never gave my dream my full wholehearted go. And I'm, that time I was 23 and, and I'm like, take this risk in my life uh, right now I can take this financial risk right now and then reap the benefits for the rest of my life struggle for the maybe next two two three years trying to set myself up but then I will never have to work in my life because it's my passion and that's that's how I find it like every Saturday Sunday I'm working but I don't consider it work because I chose this destiny. and yeah so I decided to quit my job uh, moved back to India and then yeah that's how that's how I got into this field full time uh, my heart was always in it, but my mind was not um, in it um, un fully until last May. Yeah, so that's how it ended up. <laughs> so for a, a lot of our listeners live in North America, and many of them may, may experience um, what they think is crazy traffic and craziness in the American cities. Can you just tell them about your experience leaving D.C. and going, going back to New Delhi and how that felt? My word, yeah. Guys, I mean... If you live in the U.S., uh, you guys are so lucky. You guys have it so well. Everyone uh, pays attention to, to the rules and regulations. The air quality is fantastic. Um, the, the sanitation and everything else uh, is amazing. And you have so much uh, nature around you. Uh, but here in Delhi, I mean, I'm swamped uh, with really bad air quality, really bad traffic. Um, and people don't really usually follow rules and laws. Um, though once you get out of out of New Delhi and get to some of the exterior parts, um, like rural Central India, uh, that's where all the beauty is, uh, according to me. That's a world apart. Uh, people also in Central India are so nice. So yeah, I think I think you know just just talking about this, I definitely do miss Washington D.C. I do miss U.S. I miss all my friends. Um, they they were like my family. Uh, I even had a dog, which I, which now my best friend keeps him. His name's Captain. He was the Golden Shepherd, so I miss him dearly. But I think at the end of the day, it, it helps that I made this decision for myself, and there were no external factors playing a role in it. I mm. get to yeah, make documentaries and bring to light what I love doing. So we've got uh, lots of people listen to this or into traveling and going to cool new places. Where, um, if people are thinking about coming to explore the outdoors in India, um, what should be top of their bucket list, according to you? 
Um, yeah, so India is a huge country. It has so much stuff. I think number one, I always tell people, uh, reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook. I'm happy to help you. I love, love showing people around, but also recommending destinations. If I myself want to travel around, uh, I do a real, like I do Safari with Suyash, uh, real life experiences. So I had people from different countries this past January uh, come through. We, we had people from UK, Germany, US, Singapore, uh, France, Italy, uh, all come to see tigers in India. Um, in different groups, and I led the tour. Uh, but if you, uh, yeah, definitely reach out to me on any of the channels. I'm happy to help you guys. Uh, but I think just off of the head, um, you know, definitely explore North India in the Himalayas. If you're into hiking, rock climbing, uh, if you're into stunning, beautiful views, um, then in the south side, you have tropical forests. The beaches in the south in Kerala and Tamil Nadu are beautiful as well. Uh, what people often forget is, India also has islands, uh, which is Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and also Lakshadweep Islands. Uh, amazing place uh, for travelers, especially for those looking to do some snorkeling or scuba diving uh, or any water-related ac activities. Uh, and then, of course, you have tigers, you have lions, you have leopards, uh, you have rhinos and elephants. Uh, I recommend Central Indian landscape. Um, so you look at Bandhavgarh National Park, you look at Rajasthan, uh, as well as a state, you go look, look at Ranthambhor National Park, Kanha National Park. And if you like elephants, you go to Corbett National Park. If you like rhinos, go up to Kaziranga in the Northeast. Um, basically the list goes on and that's why I say, right, if you, if you want to come to India, just reach out to me, I'll help you custom tailor it or something like that. <laughs> Super cool. And the other thing that blew my mind the first time I came to India uh, and explored around was just the how old the history is. Um, you can see like, uh, I don't know if you've been to Hampi, which is north of Mumbai, but uh, you've got temples there that date back hundreds of, if not thousands of years that are still standing today. Uh, and some of that stuff is just mind blowing when you put it with the wildlife and the scenery as well. Absolutely. I mean, India is a very historical nation as well. Uh, interestingly, so Bandavgar, where my documentary series is filmed and where I spent most of my time is, uh, it used to be a hunting reserve for the royalties uh, back in the British days and up until 1960. Uh, so we have a 7th century fold, fort and 7th century uh, monuments and standing structures there, which are now completely abandoned by people. And now you can see tigers uh, roaming around in these, in these, in these forts and caves. Um, and in fact, and it's absolutely stunning. Uh, so yeah, that's a good mix of wildlife and people. Um, and that's Bandhavgar and both Bandhavgar and Ranthambhor as well. So, I mean, where else in the world can you see a wild tiger sitting uh, underneath a big palace? Um, <laughs> um, although seven, well, it's, it's fantastic. So you said seventh, not 17th, right? As in it's a hundred, it's blimey, that's 130 years old. No, more than that, 1300 years old. Seventh century. Wow. <laughs> it just blows my mind. It just blows my mind. Um, I love it. So people can get in touch with you. I'll put the links for all your social media and websites and things in the podcast description. Um, so people can find you there. And then, um, yeah, guys and girls, if you want to go to India, go and hang out with uh, Surash and uh, have a great time seeing history and animals. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, you know, my work is in Africa, all across Africa, Costa Rica, uh, Canada, US, uh, anywhere in the world. But of course, I'm, I'm, I'm an expert on India. Uh, so come and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to show you guys tigers. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. So um, when these people come visit you or go out in the outdoors somewhere, a lot of them are going to have cameras and want to take photos. Um, and, and as you, you started in photography, um, what's your best advice to the amateur folks out there who've got phones and cameras and want to get the best possible shots of their lucky enough sightings um what, what what advice can you give people cool uh i think my advice is a uh, twofold number one people you know planning your trip uh people always think oh man i need to buy this big equipment and i don't have that much money or i just have my phone or i just have this old dslr 
uh, well, don't think about buying equipment. A lot of photographers say, you know, use the equipment you have that makes it the best. But I'm the kind of guy who says, well, now we live in a world where renting equipment is easier than ever. So, you know, you, you rent a nice lens, you rent a nice camera, and it won't cost you that much because uh, you're already spending uh, so much to get, uh, get on a holiday. Uh, or, a, or a photography tour or filming tour that you spend a little bit on the on the on the rent on the renting part uh, so you all you have a nice technology at hand you don't have to go overboard with it just get a standard nice zoom lens uh, get a standard camera with good megapixel good amount of shutter speed and then once you uh, uh, have those things um, then the then it essentially comes out to shooting as much as possible and as often as possible I think people always realize or people, you know, traveling in wildlife or nature or outdoors, um, they they uh, are two types. Usually, one that kind of know about the in outdoors, and the other that know nothing and want to know nothing. Um, so I think you need to be someone who, even if you don't know anything, you want to know everything. So there's a there's a lot to, of research uh, that you might be able to do. Um, and first, you need to be a good naturalist in terms of. Uh, uh, wildlife uh, in order to take good photographs. So the more you understand animals, the more you understand the landscape, the better photos you're going to get. And the more train, more you train yourself, uh, the better it is going to be for you. Uh, that's how I started. I trained myself completely. I just went out, shot, took hundreds, and if not, not even hundreds, like thousands and thousands of bad photographs. Um, but then I started taking good ones because I started understanding everything. Mm. So get out there and do it. That's the best, the best thing somebody can do. Get out there and give it and do some, do some planning ahead. That's all. Mm. And I, I always say to people, um, not that I'm a very good photographer, but like, don't be afraid to mess around with all the settings on your camera. Um, go and try manual and pl play around with the white balance and the exposure and whatever else and see what different effects you can get. Because with a DSLR, you can't do any wrong. You could just change the setting and take another picture afterwards. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one thing people also do is like compare themselves to others. Uh, I remember I used to do it and be like, well, my photog photographs suck. Why aren't they as good as this award-winning photographer? Well, there's a reason they're the award-winning photographer. They've been doing it for so long. So I think just com don't compare yourself to anyone. Just compare yourself to your last photograph. Simple as that. Nice. Nice. With, with regards to f photographs and filming, other than the tiger that got two meters away from your lens, what's been your most memorable time um, videoing, filming, or, or shooting shots? Oh, so many. I mean, I've been in all kinds of situations. I've been in the middle of two lions fighting uh, just five meters from my vehicle. I've been, in, I've been chased by buffaloes in South Africa. Uh, I've been um, close in the middle of an elephant herd uh, for season two, I was actually charged by an elephant. For my first film in Africa, I was charged by elephants. Um, I've had some mock charges by tigers. I mean, those things are all fantastic. And you know, this is a question I get pretty often, like what's been your craziest moment? And I think these are the kind of instances people want to listen to. Uh, but I think one of my most cherished and favorite moments was actually with bats. Um, it was during the season one filming. Uh, this was like, 30 days into the filming every day, not 30 days, I think it was 22 days or something into filming. It's been really hot every day, 48, 49 degrees Celsius. We're filming for 15 hours at a go, yeah. nonstop. Yeah, so it's crazy. Um, and you know, your brain is fried and I'm not getting good shots and the tigers are just too far away. For 10 days, I've recorded maybe five or six minutes of footage. And I was just done. I was just done. I was like, man, this is not working. Did I make the right decision by moving back to India? Because remember that that was the first 22 days of, of me being back in India. Mm. And, I came, and I just, as soon as I came back, I jumped into the pool. And it was just, just two minutes after the sunset, uh, two or five minutes after sunset rather. And the sky was completely pink and purple. And I was sitting in the pool, there was nobody there. And it was just at that time when all the birds go silent. And it was completely still, no wind, nothing. All of a sudden, I hear these whoop, whoop, flashing of wind, uh, flashing of, uh, or, or the sound of uh, wings flapping. And all of a sudden, there are bats all around me. 
and it's purple and they, I can only see them their black silhouette against the sky and then they come near me and then they took a dip you know how they put they skid past the water to drench their chest uh, so that they can go and feed their babies or drink water afterward because they lick their water off from the chest and that's what they kept doing in front of me and oh my god it felt amazing and you know then, then it, i realized man i really did the right decision this is what i live for um it's not for everyone but this is what i live for uh, so yeah that's my favorite moment uh, i wish i could show it to people but it was something that it was just if you were there in the moment you would know <laughs> So do you find that your favorite moments, um, you very rarely have a camera or uh, anything to record with it? It's just um, so spontaneous that you can't almost, almost can't be prepared for it. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, there's, there have definitely been a lot of moments that I've been able to capture on film. Um, but nonetheless, there have also been moments that I've been like, oh, I absolutely love it and cherish it for a lifetime uh, that I don't have a camera on me or someone to record it. Mm. I take my hat off because people like you bring the outdoors that other people will never get to see um, into people's homes. And yet there is something that the camera can't, and even a great storyteller with a camera can't necessarily get across that is more special when you're there and you experience it in person. I've, um, I've sailed a lot and, you know, cameras on the sea flatten out winds and waves so the camera makes it look tranquil and looks it makes it look calm. And actually it's, it's blowing a gale and it's four meter seas. But the same with the animals in the wild, you, you just can't, you can't almost can't measure that experience that you get by actually being close to it yourself. Absolutely, 100%, true, true. So people should go to India and come, come tour with you and go and see stuff, that's what I think. Um, so, let's do it let's make it a thing i'm getting more tempted by the seconds just sat here talking to you to be honest um so what what is there that you never leave home without in terms of uh, equipment cameras stuff what is it that goes everywhere with you um it's honestly my three three things for sure uh, it's it's a it's a a watch I wear it's white in color I've been wearing it for uh, nine years uh, my sister gave it and then there are two uh, two uh, beads or kind of bracelets I wear uh, which essentially I bought uh, a couple of years ago and it go towards lion conservation uh, lions basically because my last name Keshri actually means lion and mm. Suya good fame my name translates into the good famed lion <laughs> wow um, yeah so yeah uh, those two things and uh, two more things are my photography jacket uh, again something i've been wearing for eight years uh, and i you know th that's like my thing uh, that people know me by and my blue sunglasses uh, those four things uh, even if i don't have a camera or binocular i need to have those four things and i just feel at home when i have that <laughs> And is there a certain order that you have to put them all on or as long as they're all on you're happy uh, no as long as long as they're on, on i'm happy <laughs> when, I, when i go white water kayaking i um i have like this set pattern of how i get dressed and the final thing that signifies i'm ready to go is clipping up my helmet that snap of the clip going um, and that signifies something in my brain that that's it i'm ready to go kayaking now but unless if i put the helmet on uh, not as the last thing. I don't feel anywhere near as prepared for some bizarre reason. Uh, just that smart click gets you going on. Huh? That's it. That's it. It's like now's game time. So if, if you could make one difference in the world, in the outdoor world, what, what would it be and why? Uh, I think the difference I would make, oh, there's so many. I think mean, that's such a hard question to ask. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, but I think if, if one difference I would make is for more people, uh, especially the younger generations, people my age to get out. I mean, I live in Delhi, one of the most populated cities in the world. And I was uh, so sad to find out that a lot of my friends, a lot of people younger than me, uh, they have never seen a bird besides a crow or a pigeon. Um, and they don't know what a sunrise uh, looks like or the last twinkling light of, of, a, of a sun setting 
I think I, I wish what I would change is more ways for people to get excited to explore the outdoors and become one with nature. Because uh, you know, in my in my trailer, in fact, I say I say uh, what we um, what we can see, we can love, and what we can love, we will fight to protect. So those three things are very important, and they start by exploring outdoors. The one thing I would do is if I could get more people to get outdoors, explore it in a sustainable manner. That's one change I would make. I don't think not. I don't think enough people are doing it nowadays. Mm. And certainly in many countries in the world, actually, with like health and safety and litigation, it's almost like the outdoors is getting sanitized um, and probably unnecessarily. Yeah, so true. So true. So that's what we can see, we can love and what we love, we can protect. Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the essence of my series. That's where it originates from. The idea, that's the essence of my photography and filming. If I can show you tigers, what you've never seen in your life, if I can show you the habitat uh, through a film or in real life, and then if I can get you, uh, by showing that, if, you're, if I can get your emotions to fall in love with it, um, then I can get you to protect it because what you love, you protect. And what you can see, you will love. Um, that, that's, the, that's the sense of it. That is phenomenal. What, what is there you think that people should know about lions, elephants, tigers, rhinos that isn't very often spoken about? What, what do you experience that can't be put across in film? Uh, I think people always have this, uh, you know, about these big animals, uh, especially predators, that they are, uh, they are aggressive. But in my experiences, I've, I have seen predators uh, and also rhinos and elephants and animals, and they're generally peaceful. Uh, in fact, when I'm out in the bush, uh, especially if I'm walking, what I'm the most scared of is a warthog, uh, which <laughs> people would, yeah, because warthogs, they don't care. They'll just ram on you without a doubt. <laughs> and I, I've, I've nearly been chased by a warthog as well, uh, even after having this doubt. But I think, you know, it's so difficult to portray it in a film because every film out there talks about um, lions and tigers being these specialized killing machines and uh, elephants, um, especially the bull elephants, being these aggressive uh, giants and rhinos being these, uh, you know, threatening uh, individuals with those big horns. I think it's very difficult to show through film um, because it's kind of romanticizing these animals in, in a way because people like to be like, oh my God, a tiger, that's so scary. That's crazy, dude. But really, like in reality, these are very docile animals. And if you keep a distance and if you're not doing anything, they're just going to go their way. Uh, and they're generally very, very, very peaceful. Mm. I often find that um, uh, when I'm in the bush, is and i say this to people often is just because this big animal looks docile and comfortable doesn't mean to say you should get too co you should get too comfortable with them because they are actually still a predator and um, given half the chance you know they they wouldn't mind a second breakfast um but, but that's also that, gone yeah i said yeah that's very true because that's why i said right you know once you keep your distance uh, they'll be completely fine um, but what you say is like absolutely paramount because people think, oh, you know, now that Suyasha said that animals, especially tigers, are cute and cuddly, let's go cuddle tigers. And the next moment you have someone dead and then my name is on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. I mean, we have people in Kruger the whole time who, who are getting out of their cars to take pictures of lions. And um, I, I think they need to go and see a good psychologist because one day that won't end very well. For the, it won't end well for the lion as well because the lion will probably be put that are euthanized because if it attacks a human. Um, so yeah, there's, there's people who do some crazy stuff. Oh, hello? Yeah, can you hear me? I can, sorry, it disappeared for a second. I'll, I'll edit that bit out. Um, the, the last thing I really like, the warthog statement, is that uh, my experience in the outdoors also suggests that it's, ne it's rarely the big things that will make a mess of you. And often it's snakes, spiders, and little insignificant things that will bite you or do horrible things to you that are just as dangerous as the big obvious things. 
Yeah, yeah, 100%. So what do you think the next big thing is in wildlife photography or will, uh, wildlife documentary making? What do you think is going to happen, going to be next as the next big thing in the world? Oh, interesting question. I think, you know, uh, if, if your viewership or you have watched Planet Earth 2 um, and all the new BBC style documentaries, you see the camera movement be, is, is, is like, like Hollywood. Um, they blockbuster style filming and it's involving regular people as well. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the newer side is going to be a mix. I think it's going to involve famous people uh, and influencers and involve regular people uh, to connect with nature. Um, and it's going to, it's going to look like, look like Planet Earth 2, but also have a person in front of it, uh, kind of like wildlife presenting. I think, um, you know, think, think about all the wildlife presenters that people know of. It's Steve Winter, it's David Attenborough, uh, it's Steve McCurry, it's, uh, it's, it's um, so many other people and they, they're, a, they're a class apart and they're, they, they were essentially at the prime of their career and most of their work was early 2000s or maybe a little uh, over 2008, 2010. So we've had this gap for the last 10 years where there haven't been many wildlife presenters at that, for, uh, at that level um, because most of these people have retired from um, doing wildlife presenting on field and moved on to narrating. Uh, so I think it, in terms of filming, it will be presentation style because the minute you are able to put a person in front of different animals or nature, then people can connect to nature through that person. Uh, so I think that's going to be the trend in filming and, and, and nature documentaries. Uh, but I think outdoors as a general, it will be more experiential learning. Uh, so we're going to have more uh, VR stuff come up. We're going to have more uh, people get involved in these things. Um, with the digital photography, Instagram and Facebook age, uh, these two things, digital and Instagram and Facebook age, the social media age has combined together to, to, to make a new uh, league of photographers and filmmakers. So I think we're definitely going to see more people get involved in, in different manners uh, that we haven't seen before. Cool. I'm all in favor. The more people who get involved, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I just want to take this opportunity just to thank you and, and recognize you um, as someone who's bringing the outdoors into people's homes um, and, and giving them experiences through what you do that they never would have had otherwise. I think that people doing what you do is going to help protect the outdoors for generations to come and leave a, a true legacy behind you that very few people do. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for that and thank you for your time on the podcast today. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I really hope I can continue to do this uh, for the rest of my life. Um, and thank you for your listeners, too, uh, for tuning in to this podcast. Uh, once again, I would love for them to see my series. Uh, it's on YouTube uh, at WWF International, or you can just type Safari with Suyash. Uh, follow me on Instagram, Facebook. I'm very regular on those two channels. If you DM me 100%, I'm going to reply. Uh, so yeah, connect with me and I would love to uh, talk to you guys and get to know you guys more. Uh, so yeah, thank you Rob for this opportunity. This has been fantastic. No worries. Cool. Thank you, sir. This episode is brought to you by the We Get Outdoors tribe, where your next adventure is just one click away. You can join this, the fastest growing outdoor group on planet Earth and become part of a tribe of like-minded outdoor enthusiasts sharing your adventures, their adventures, trips and insights and helping to ensure you plan and have the most perfect adventures. Click on the link in the description below to join for free right now.